legally in 1974. So 1933 to 74, you could not own gold in the United States, right? Um, Unless it was now, jewelry, what, or I think there's a couple exceptions in there. Or a few exceptions, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Marilyn Monroe was, was known for having jewelry, right? And so that wasn't confiscated. But, yeah. you know, essentially today, only 12% of Americans own any gold at all. Check out the website, simplepassivecashflow.com for podcasts, videos, articles, and free e-courses. If you guys have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to the team via email and we'll get you pointed in the right direction, whether it be an educational course or information about syndication deals. If you haven't read my book, The Journey to Simple Passive Cashflow, click the link below to get a free copy. Thanks to John and the Wealth and Freedom Nexus podcast. Our team is here to help you take the first step, or if you're a seasoned investor, then we're here to expand your reach into alternative investing. You know, for the most passive returns in real estate investing, I like to put my money with Freedom Family Investments, a team I personally trust because they pay me steady streams of cash flow, hassle-free, all while doing the things I love. Returns are better and more reliable than the stock market, up to 12%. I love that tax benefits offset capital gains or your W-2 income. For a little insider pro tip, knowing who to trust is key to success in investing. Freedom Family Investments has a perfect track record of paying their investors right on time. To learn more, text FAMILY to 66866. If you want to invest on autopilot with people I personally trust and with a team who cares about you reaching your financial goals, go ahead and text FAMILY to 66866. Eight six six. Are you tired of trying to keep ahead in the rat race only to have so much of your hard earned money going to the tax collector? Equity doesn't pay the bills. Retirement savings don't pay you now and there are only 24 hours in a day to work. The only solution is passive income that pays you 24 seven now, not 40 years from now. From vetted investment opportunities to tax saving strategies. Let John guide you through all the confusion and take control of your financial life in pursuit of financial freedom. So sit back, relax, and welcome to the Wealth and Freedom Nexus. Hey there, welcome back to another great episode of the WFN podcast. As always, I'm your host, John Rickard, an investor, educator, and realtor. For those that are just joining for the first time, thank you for uh, listening in and hope you find value in this uh, podcast and can learn from everything that I've learned over the last, oh boy, nine years of my financial education journey from my ups, the downs, the mistakes as well as new investments that I come across and that I feel everyone should at least look into or maybe even just learn about, just kind of know what all is out there. I think too often we are maybe brainwashed thinking, oh, the only investments out there, you know, is the stock market. I have to put my IRA, my brokerage account, my 401k, I just have to put that in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and that's all that I can invest in. And unfortunately, or fortunately, that is far from the truth. Unfortunately, just too many people don't know about this. So hence one of the many reasons I started this podcast almost two years ago to educate and inform others so that they can start on their journey towards wealth and freedom and hopefully even cut that journey down a little bit from what I've been doing so they can kind of learn from my mistakes and, hey, this has worked well for me. This didn't. This this company filed for bankruptcy or whatever the case may be. So for those watching this on YouTube, you see above my shoulder, feel free to follow me on my social media channels wfreedomnexus.com. You can find the Wealth and Freedom Nexus podcast, whatever your favorite platform of choice for podcast is. If you are a Stitcher fan, if you're listening to this, I hope you found something different, (laughs) whether that's Apple, whether that's Spotify, whether that's Good Pods, Podbean, Overcast, iHeart. Stitcher went away at the end of 
August. So there's many other platforms out there. So hope you find one that works out well for you. And then finally on YouTube, uh, when it comes to YouTube, we are sitting at over 1600 subscribers on YouTube. So for all my subscribers out there, thank you for your support and patronage on that. Let's see if we can get that above 2000 subscribers by the end of 2023. At the time of this recording, there's over 250 total videos. And we'll be releasing more shorts, you know, one minute or less shorts, as well as my uh, new upcoming segment, Finance in Five, uh, that I started in 2023, where I cover financial topics in five minutes or less. Uh, for those that know me and see my videos, uh, one of my top rated videos is on Roth conversions. Um, and I also did uh, 30 ways to get started in real estate back in April of 2022. Uh, I love to talk and I love to nerd out on financial topics. I could talk about them all day long, whether it's uh, Roth conversions or whether it's uh, alternative investments in a 401k Roth plan that's self-directed or how to house hack or utilize an FHA or VA loan to buy a fourplex, live in one unit, rent out the other three, pretty much live rent-free, subsidizing from the government for the down payment and the payments, and then subsidizing of the monthly mortgage payments by your tenants. So like I said, I'm kind of a finance nerd. I kind of love talking about this, love educating, love sharing this to my friends, family, listeners out there. But like I said, I know your time is valuable. I know not everyone is like me that's going to sit down and watch a 20, 30, 40 minute video. So I know your time is valuable. Hence the new segments, finance and five or shorts of just really kind of quick little you know, golden financial nuggets, if you will. Moving on with the podcast, if you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify or whatever your podcast platform or choice is, we are at over 220,000 downloads worldwide uh, at the time of this recording. And we seem to pick up new subscribers every single week. So to my subscribers listening in San Jose, California, Cypress, California, Urbandale, Iowa, Benton, New Jersey, just naming a few, it's kind of like a geography lesson every week. I see a new towns and cities pop up that I've never heard of before. It's like, oh, okay, this person seems to be downloading regularly. So for those listening, and if you happen to be living in those towns, thank you again for your support and continuing listenership. I really do appreciate it. And uh, if, again, this is your first time joining us, or if you've uh, just been listening for a while, feel free to go back to all 100 plus episodes that I've released since November of 2021. Be sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you'd be so kind, if you can think of even, you know, just one person in your network, just one person among your friends, family, coworkers, colleagues, et cetera, that you think, hey, I really think they should listen to this, or wow, I found this interesting. I bet they never knew you could self-direct an IRA or whatever the financial topic was, feel free to share that. Like I said, I bring this content up every single Wednesday. Let's see if we can end up, let's see what we can end up for downloads by the end of 2023. Now for today's uh, podcast, it's been quite a while since I did an episode on precious metals. And then I figured, you know, it's maybe time to readdress this or look at another option. Now, if you for the longtime listeners or for the ones just are uh, just joining us, feel free to go back to episode five or fifty-three. You can find those in the show notes where I had Dana Samuelson for uh, of Amerigold coming in talking about gold and inflation and silver and ways to acquire it, but then also uh, protect it. In fact, you know, two of the best ways to protect your precious metal holdings is by holding it in a secure vault. Two options available that I've had experience with as well are silver bullion out of Singapore, and then TDS vaults, which actually has a number of depositories worldwide, one of their most, I don't know, I say famous or maybe well-known or most utilized is their vault in Las Vegas, Nevada. But with either of these options, you have the benefit of collateralizing your precious metals. So if you have, you know, I'm just throwing out a number, you know, $10,000 of precious metals, you may be able to get a loan out on those, you know, maybe 50, 60% loan to value. You know, simple numbers, if you have $10,000 of precious metals, if you have an investment that comes up, you might be able to take out a collateralized loan using your precious metal holdings as collateral for the loan and get, you know, five, $6,000 cash in your bank account that you can utilize, hopefully for another investment with a higher return than what you're paying on interest. 
pay back the loan and then just rinse and repeat. This is a very common financial practice, kind of arbitrage, if you will, where you borrow at one rate and hopefully a lower rate and invest at a higher rate. And then your profit is the spread. And this can be done with precious metals. This can be done with whole life policies that I mentioned on the show before, as well as even stocks in a regular brokerage account where you can borrow on margin. You can't do that in an IRA or to my knowledge, even a 401k. This has to be a, a non-qualified account, brokerage account with you know Fidelity or Charles Schwab or whatever the case may be. So with that, I actually wanted to bring on a guest that had a new, shall we say, twist or a new option if you have precious metals and a way to cash flow them or make money off them that isn't a loan. And this really kind of intrigued me. I had never heard of this and I figured it's like, well, geez, you know, I'm kind of, like I said, I kind of nerd out on financial topics. If I've never heard about this, my guess is that very few, if any, of my listeners have heard about this. So figured, you know, it's time to bring this guest on, share what he has learned and how this is a new opportunity, like I said, to cash flow or make money on your precious metals. So a quick review of the, today's guest is Jerry Feta. He actually grew up in Alaska. He actually experienced his parents divorcing and repeated homelessness at a young age. So young age, homeless, parents divorced, you know, not exactly the best upbringing. He worked in the financial industry for over a decade, he actually started as a financial advisor at 18. He has been, shall we say, accustomed or had experience with all the quote unquote gurus out there, whether it's the baby steps with Dave Ramsey. He was a financial advisor with Dave Ramsey at one point. Not anymore. We'll get into that just a little bit later. Partnered with some other podcasts. Also became a licensee through Grant Cardone, has been the Forbes Financial Council. And like I said, he started off as being homeless and kind of a rough upbringing, if you will, but then achieved, made it to the top 1% of income earners in the United States just by age 23. And had built a multi-million dollar company, personal net worth in the seven figures and operated, like I said, several companies. But when it comes to finance, financial programs or topics, whether it's the latte plan with David Bach or the rich dad, poor dad playbook with Robert Kiyosaki or Grant Cardone, pretty much every financial program he has seen or tried or heard of. And like I said, with his businesses, he is the owner and founder of Wealth Dynamics. And you can find links to that in the show notes as well. He and his team help thousands of families across the country simplify their money so they can stop losing out on dollars to debt, taxes, and financial institutions, and instead keep and use those dollars to build wealth now. Uh, Jerry is also very passionate about helping families become financially educated so that they can navigate their economic futures with certainty and help build more prosperous communities around them. So obviously, it's going to be hard to kind of dive into this really deep in just one podcast. So probably going to have Jerry back at a later time. But today, this is going to be focusing on a program or an opportunity, if you will. Like I said, if you have precious metals, if you're looking at precious metals, but then you think, oh, this is just you know, a shiny rock as one of my college professors called it, that just sits in a vault or sits in a bank account or, or you know, bank vault or sits in a safe in my house. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't produce anything for me. It doesn't produce any cash flow. Uh, you're going to want to listen in because there, there is a way to make a cash flow. And again, like I said, I had never heard about this. So I figured, and you know, full transparency, I have not done this yet. I'm still very green on this. I didn't even know about this opportunity. So I figured, hey, if I don't know about this and I found value in it, more than likely, one of, at least one of my listeners is going to find value in this. And probably very few, if any of my current listeners have even heard about this opportunity. So with that, we're going to get into my interview with Jerry Feta and talk about this uh, very interesting way to cash flow your precious metals after a word from one of our longtime sponsors. For investors seeking DSCR financing, check out timothyhero.com. The guy has closed over 150 DSCR loans in the last two years and has been appearing on podcasts and written about by journalists. He's well connected with some of the best lenders in the game and can get you the financing for your rental properties. Jerry, thanks for coming on the show. How are things with you? Hey, John. Thanks for having me on. Things are going really good. 
Good. Now for my listeners, now I followed you, you know, we connected on LinkedIn a number of years ago, whatnot, and we share similar, you know, interests and thought processes and whatnot. But can you first for my listeners, just kind of give us a brief background on yourself and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my vision, you know, in in what I do with my company, kind of how I got started, you know, my my backstory is I grew up in poverty, right? And so when I was uh, eight years old, you know, and as a kid, you don't necessarily know these things are going on. As an adult, you have hindsight and you're like, wow, that's what my family was going through at the time. So the summer I was eight years old, my mom and dad got divorced over finances. Our house got foreclosed on, the car got repoed. I was homeless on the side of my mom and on my dad. My dad, we were living in a tent at my mom's house, we were living in a dry camper behind somebody's house. And wow. that was my upbringing with money. I didn't have a role model. I didn't have financial education. I didn't even have someone that had money that I could look at and be like, this is what it's supposed to be, right? So fast forward several years, you know, at the age of 17, I had quit on money. I remember my older brother one day, and I don't know why this mattered to me at the age of 17, John, but when I was 17 years old, my older brother told me that the US dollar wasn't backed by anything. Mm-hmm. And so I had my my past experiences as a kid. And I remember thinking like, like, A, money was this source of pain and problems for me. And then <laughs> B, it's not even worth anything. Yep. <laughs> why am I spending my entire time working? And I, I literally I remember calling it monopoly money. I was like, why am I going to go to school and go to college yeah. and work my life away from monopoly money? And so, you know, I made the decision at that time that I wasn't going to participate. And each individual has that, right? We've all got the ability to either go into what I call poverty, which is what I did. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to participate. And I actually ended up homeless the first six months of being married married as a result of that. Uh, There's denial, which is let's sweep it under the rug. Let's go to Olive Garden on the weekends, drive our German vehicles, (laughs) vote Democrat or Republican and and pretend (laughs) it's happening. Then we've got wealth, right? And so I finally learned you've got to do wealth. And that's That's what my company helps people do. And so our vision is a world that's able to live lives of abundance and prosperity in all areas because they can financially afford that. They can fund that. And so we help families, individuals, entrepreneurs, those that are, you know, willing, able, and they're going to do the right things when we teach them. We help them become more financially educated. We help them build greater financial security and ultimately getting greater financial freedom in life. Gotcha. Now with this, I'm assuming this is the Dave Ramsey approach, cut up all your credit cards, pay cash, pay off your, all your debts and eat rice and beans for five, 10, 15 years. Right. You know, funny enough, I was actually endorsed by Dave. <laughs> oh, wow. Several years. <laughs> I was, I was a Dave Ramsey endorsed local provider in eight States. And so for a while, that's what I was doing. You okay. know, I got licensed as a financial professional at the age of 18. I just turned 31. And uh, at 18 years old, I was getting my licenses. And so I went to work for Dave in my early 20s. Really? And that was the message. It was budget, scrim, live on beans and rice, cut up the credit cards. And, you know, and his his program is what he advertises. It's baby steps. Yeah. You know, there was a dinner between uh, Dave Ramsey and a billionaire named Gary Keller. And I remember at the, they were, they were, they were, I was hearing the story of this. I remember hearing the story at the dinner. Gary Keller's talking to Dave and he basically tells Dave, like, Dave is an alcoholic, but with debt. This is what Gary (laughs) told Dave. So Gary's like, I can have a glass of wine and be just fine. And he's like, an alcoholic cannot. So they have to get rid of the alcohol. And you were an alcoholic. You made very bad decisions with debt. So you can't have it in your space. I can, because I I, I can tolerate that. It's okay Mm -hmm. with me. But my approach now is very different. You know, one of the first things we do is we teach people to become their own bank, right? I know that Mm -hmm. your listeners are very familiar with that. And the goal is, you know, incrementally and gradually, it's like dominoes in the right sequence, in the right order, achieving greater levels of financial freedom until you're financially independent, where your passive income exceeds your savings, expenses, and taxes. Yeah. And I think that's probably the key uh, point. This is a big central theme of my uh, show is, you know, passive income. I think we're just programmed from school, you know, go to school, get good grades, get a job, you know, get great benefits, a 401k, et cetera, but that's active income. There's only 24 hours in a day, but whether it's right. rental properties, online marketing, sponsorships, affiliates, royalties, so on and so forth, there's no limit to the number of passive income streams you can get. And I think that's right. where the feeling of abundance comes from. It's like, okay, there's a limit to how many hours I can work, but there's no limit to the number of passive streams I can create in my life. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And I think that that's a thing that, um, you know, the, the, the concept of you work at a job for 40 years, 
I lovingly call it, you know, serving, you know, 40 hours a week, spending the 40 to 60 year life sentence trading mm-hmm. time for money so yep. that you can build up the nest egg and then hopefully die before the money runs out. Yep. Um, or maybe you die before you even get to retirement. I think that's the biggest thing. I always say, you know, do not defer your life. You know, my backstory, I'm sure my listeners are familiar with both, both my parents passed away in their fifties by the time I was 16. So it's like, well, why um, defer your life? Why get this whole big nest egg, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, you have no guarantee you're going to make it to 62, 65, 70, whatever arbitrary date you pick out there. So why not start mm-hmm. living your life now and start creating cash flow now? Cause that right, wrong, or indifferent, the Dave Ramsey's others out there, basically what they're saying is build up this big nest egg, uh, pile of money, whatever you want to call it. And then come 65, that will create one stream basically for you. Well, why not work on that stream while you're still alive and can enjoy life? <laughs> Yeah. And you and I, we have a similar story with that. So, so I got my financial licenses at the age of 18. My mom was my first client. Okay. And uh, at 59 and a half, that's the, the age we can pull our money out of these retirement accounts. She turned 60 and she got diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And six months later, she was gone. So I had that same thing happen. And for me, you know, as a son, I saw that and I was like, I, you know, as, as a, as a son, you hate to see that happen with your parents mm-hmm. as a young financial advisor. You know, that was another aspect of like the entire plan literally just unraveled in front of me with my own mom. Like everything you're told you're supposed to do is like, this doesn't actually work. What if you don't live that long? Exactly. Yeah, I think I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but I want to say this was a few years back, but I think the Department of Human Services said like by age 65, it was like 25% of all people were dead, 30 or 40% were still working or on government's or subsidies or whatever, like only 5% were either truly sufficient or financially free, if you will. It's like, well, why go down this route if you, by the government's own admission, you have about a 95% chance of failure? (laughs) Right, right. And that's that's from the Social Security Administration. That's their stat. You know, and and so for me, when I started learning about this stuff, you know, I I was doing the mutual funds. I was telling people, buy term, invest the difference. I was telling them, you know, cut up your credit cards, and I remember sitting down with someone at the time who was a mentor of mine, and he just passed last year, you know, but he's in a better place now. And so at the time, like he was a mentor of mine, I sat down with him and I showed him and I was showing him a financial product and, and I was brand new. I was doing my field training. I was trying to make my first couple of sales. And I remember he just wasn't interested. Mm-hmm. And this guy was very into real estate. He was very into passive income. He was very into mm-hmm. private lending, seller finance. I didn't know any of this at the time. And growing up, all I remember is he never seemed like he was working, but he always had money. <laughs> yep. And this this was like in high school. So he was like, you know, you have this rich dad, poor dad thing. He was a bit like my rich dad. And I remember sitting down with them and showing him, you know, the it was a called a fixed index annuity. I was showing him, okay, you can never lose money. There's guaranteed mm-hmm. upside. It participates in the market, but you're not in the market. And I remember him explaining it back to me. He's like, so let me let me make sure I've got this straight, Jerry. And he explains it back to me. And when he explained it back to me, it sounded really, really bad. And it also made more sense. Like he knew of the product better than I did. And when he explained it to me with simplicity and clarity, it didn't sound like a good product anymore. Mm-hmm. And that led me to then start studying. Cause I kept having these, you know, once every, every few dozen clients, I would have one of these guys that was into real estate and he had a business and this and that, and he just didn't want the 401k. Yeah. You know, he didn't want the mutual fund. He didn't want the retirement game. So when I finally started researching, I was like, you know, I grew up in Alaska, you know, C, C average student, 62 kids in my graduating class didn't go to college. So I'm not this book smart, highly sophisticated guy, but I'm smart enough to know when something keeps happening, it's a pattern. Mm-hmm. And so I started to study, John, I was like, well, what are the wealthy actually doing? So I went back and I read the biographies of, you know, Rockefeller and Carnegie and the Morgans mm-hmm. and the Vanderbilts. And I started seeing these commonalities of what they were doing. And they weren't getting involved in the stock market. They right. didn't even have financial advisors. They used something called a family office instead. Uh-huh. You know, they use the life insurance as their own banking source. They're using gold and silver. They're getting into real estate. They own businesses, right? And, and so I started seeing like they they offer and advertise products and services to middle-class America, but they don't use those things themselves. Uh-huh. And that's really for me where I started to research, well, you know, as a financial professional and as an individual, I want to do what the wealthy are doing. 
Yeah. I, I was a bodybuilder in the gym. You see a guy with big quads, you copy him. <laughs> what does he do? I'm going to yep. do the same thing. Very simple. <laughs> so if money, the same thing. I was like, I want to just study these wealthy guys and see what they're doing. Yeah. And I, I started seeing instant results with it. You probably noticed the same, John. It's cause and effect of you do X and then you get Y. And it's like, as soon as you do that, that's what happens. There's not this yeah. mystery of, is it going to work? Or what if it goes down? Or how long is it going to take? Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of touched on a number of things. And I think you and I could go down several rabbit holes and talk for hours on end. But thinking back when you mentioned, you know, one of your mentors was in the private lending. And I always kind of look at it where the wealthy really have, shall we say, got this system that if the quote market goes up, down or sideways, whatever's happening, they can still mm -hmm. protect their income and they can still grow their income and grow their wealth. Most mm -hmm. of the 401ks, IRAs, it's like, well, it works as long as the stock market keeps going up. If it goes down or sideways, you know, it doesn't work all that well. And you mentioned the private lending. I mean, I kind of still chuckle. I mean, I'm a one of my many hats I wear as a realtor. And, you know, just the other day I talked to someone, their interest rate was quoted at 6.1%, which is not bad. But when you're used to three, four percent, it's like kind of a sticker shock. And everyone's like, yeah. oh, these raising rates are, you know, so bad. It's like, well, it depends on what side of the desk you're on. I do right. private lending through my Roth IRA. I'm getting trust deeds paying 10 to 12 percent. And it's like, okay, rates are going higher. That's good for me. <laughs> so, and yeah, that's yeah. another topic I touched base on. See, that was episode number 57. So, you know, I think like you said, with the wealthy, they just have a different view of money. They look at things differently. They do things differently. And if you want to be part of the, you know, call it the 1%, you can't do what the 99% are doing. No, that's so true. And and that's like, you hit it on the head. I was having this, this exact conversation with one of my staff members the other day, John, and they have, they have an infinite banking policy. We call it the mm -hmm. sacred account, but it's the idea of using life insurance as your own banking system. Yeah. And he was asking about the rising rates. And he's like, you know, rates are rising. What does that mean for my policy? And so I was letting him know. I was like, well, <laughs> that means your dividends are going to go up. Yeah. I was like, like if you're the bank, like rising rates are a good thing. Do you think Bank of America and Wells Fargo and JP Morgan are complaining that rates are going up right now? Yeah. No, they love it because, exactly. you know, their, their interest bearing investments increase. And then when they loan money out to others, they're able to charge that higher rate. So uh -huh. really the person it impacts is the consumer and, and you don't ever want to be a retail financial consumer. Yeah. Uh, and that's what much of this this financial world is banks, Wall Street, IRS based plans. It, it's the McDonald's and Starbucks of the financial world, right? It, it's not just just because you saw a McDonald's commercial does not make you a nutritionist. Right? It means <laughs> yeah. You got well advertised to by a company that wants to sell you their product. And the same would go for someone that's seeing, you know, on CNBC and, you know, these commercials about invest here or buy this mm -hmm. product or put your money there. You're watching a McDonald's commercial for money. Yep, exactly. So now, Jerry, one uh, topic I kind of wanted to dive into, and I myself, I'll admit, I know nothing about this. So this is something I kind of wanted to bring you on. This is the first time I've heard about it. So now I've had a number of guests on my show talk about precious metals, you know, gold and silver. I own gold and silver. Um, mm -hmm. Now I'm familiar with, you know, collateralizing it. And we can kind of go into detail about that later where you borrow money at, let's just say 7%. You invest it at 12, you have a 5% spread and arbitrage with it. Now, one mm -hmm. of the, shall we say, lessons you've taught to your clients, because I do think precious metals, you know, I'm not a you know huge gold guy, like, oh, you need to have 40% of your net worth in gold or anything like that. But I think it needs mm -hmm. to be a part of your portfolio. But you've come across a different way to really make money on precious metals by, as I, under I understand, leasing it. Can you you know, explain what exactly is that? How does it work? Or, you know, what's the inside of that? Hey, everyone, John Rickgarn here. Do you want to grow your money guaranteed and tax free and have access to liquid cash for real estate investing? Infinite banking, high cash value, whole life policies allow you to grow money guaranteed and tax free. See what the infinite banking concept will do for you. Reach out to Barry Brooksby, the infinite banking expert, to see your own numbers. His email is barry at focuswealthgroup.com. Barry is a personal friend of mine who's helped me over the past seven years. He'll teach you how to grow more wealth, guaranteed and tax-free. Email him at barry at focuswealthgroup.com or go to wealthandfreedomnexus.com backslash infinite banking.
Yeah, I love this 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 program. So precious metals. So so kind of back to my backstory, John. When I started researching all this stuff, and we tend to call it like alternative assets or like alternative finance, really it's fundamental. It came first, right? The financial advisor wasn't around till 1970. This the mutual funds weren't popular till the 1930s. Yeah. Gold, silver, life insurance, real estate. This stuff has been around way before, right? So mm -hmm. gold and silver, it has a, a special place in my heart because that was the first thing that cracked the, the egg open is when I learned about gold and silver and i learned about the federal reserve system and the fact mm -hmm. the dollar used to be backed by gold and it's a true store of value <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and i could just go on and on about like people need to be more educated just on owning gold mm -hmm. right prior to 1971 by nature of owning a dollar you had access to gold because the dollar was backed by gold to some degree that was undone in 1971 mm -hmm. and people were allowed to finally own gold again legally in 1974 so 1933 to 74 you could not own gold in the United States, right? Um, Unless it was now, jewelry, what, or I think there's a couple exceptions in there. Or, a few exceptions, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Marilyn Monroe was was known for having uh, jewelry, right? And so that wasn't confiscated. But, yeah. you know, essentially today, only 12% of Americans own any gold at all. Really? So we went from, <laughs> yeah, we went from everyone owning a little bit to literally 88% of the population own none of it. And when you bring wow. it up with someone, they're like, well, why would I own that? That's just mm -hmm. a shiny rock. What does it actually I've do? heard that too, yep. <laughs> Fantastic store of value, right? So with gold, the problem is, as long as you've got the education, it's a great store of value. This is not something you're buying to trade and you're moving mm -hmm. it back and forth. It's literally like buying land or buying like a, a property. Now, the problem is that gold doesn't cash flow. Right. And if you talk to any sophisticated investor, that's the first point they're going to bring up. They're going to say, well, John, it doesn't produce an income mm -hmm. and I don't want to just let it sit there. So it right. tends to be like kind of a, a secondary source of liquidity because you can sell out of it if you need it. As you mentioned, you can borrow against it. But there's a program called gold leasing. Hmm. So gold leasing works like this. So I own physical and it's key. You're not going to be buying, never buy paper, right? Yep. never buy you know digits. Like You want to buy physical. So mm -hmm. you're buying physical gold uh, and you maintain ownership of it. And then you're leasing that out typically to a bullion dealer or a jeweler. And so the lease company that we work with, they're using like the, the big guys do this. Like this is a very big part of the gold finance industry. So we're leasing metals out to JM Bullion. We're leasing metals out oh. to Mike Maloney or Gold Silver. We're okay. leasing out to Money Metals Exchange, right? So big players, Val Canby is another one. And, and so from a business standpoint, like if I'm, let's say a JM bullion, I'm a gigantic gold bullion supplier. My supply is based on what comes in from the assay, the people who are actually mil uh, minting and melting the gold and producing bars and, and coins and ounces. And that takes time. And if you're buying gold in the last two, three years, you've probably noticed the shipping times have increased. The prices yep. have gone up on the premiums <laughs> because there's a shortage yep. and it's going to continue to get worse. That's the value of gold is there's a shortage. And anyone that says the price of gold hasn't gone up or, or hasn't gone up enough, you need to quit looking at com the COMEX numbers. <laughs> yep. Right. You need to look at what is the actual like out the door price with premiums and markups included on a physical one ounce round. It went up. It went up yep. quite a bit. We can all attest to that. So if I'm a front facing retail, like a, like a JM bullion, I would lease metals similar to the way a car dealership, you drive by a car dealership, they don't own all their inventory. They're leasing that from the manufacturer. Okay. Interesting. Right. And so with gold, they're leasing a bar from me that's holding a spot until their new bar comes in from the assay. Okay. And so when I lease them my bar, I still maintain physical ownership of it. It's insured through Lloyd's of London. They're paying me interest. So I'm getting cash flow. I'm getting appreciation of gold. I'm also getting interest, yeah. typically going to be about a one to 3% interest rate per year. I get that paid monthly or quarterly. There's zero storage costs because I'm not the one storing it. They are. Okay. And then I get paid my interest, John, in gold. Oh, huh, interesting. So I get this income stream. So it works a lot like a life insurance policy from a standpoint of I've got the base rate of what the gold's going to appreciate at. That's like yeah. my dividend kind of because it's variable. The interest I already know, that's guaranteed, right? If I do a 3% lease, it's like getting a 3% guarantee on my cash value on a life insurance policy. And gotcha. then it's just, what's the variability of what gold's going to do that year? I'm earning that every month in gold, actual paid to me in gold, and then I can reinvest it as well. So what okay. I like to do is with gold leasing, so the there kind of is a sequence here. 
I believe that everyone should own some gold. And that's one of the first steps. So my company, mm -hmm. we're a gold broker and we will help people buy gold. And so if you want to start with, you know, a small amount for me, when I was 21, 22 years old, I bought my first silver and sure. that was life changing, holding it in my hands, mm -hmm. right? Just that little moment of like, this is real tangible value. I, I had the realization of this is different than paper money. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know a whole lot yet, but I could tell this was different. It was special. So I believe everyone should have that experience. The second part of it is just like a forced savings plan, you should do a monthly subscription of gold and silver. And so we have a program that our clients can do monthly huh. subscriptions and it automatically every month will get them into however much gold, however much silver, and that way it's automated. Okay. And then once you get up to the minimum is going to be 10 ounces of gold, or I believe the alternative if you're doing silver is like a thousand ounces of silver. Okay. Either way, it's about 20, 30 grand. That's the minimum to lease. Okay. Right. And so when I hit that threshold, I'm going to lease the gold out. I'm going to keep doing that monthly because now every month I can send it into my lease okay. and increase the amount that's cash flowing. And then for me, I like doing seller finance real estate. Mm -hmm. I need about 150,000 to do seller finance. That's going to get me about three homes that will pay me 12, 13% a year. And so on a gold loan, like you mentioned collateralizing, that's the third step is I get up to that probably about $200,000 range. Okay. If I borrow 75% of my gold value, that's about 150. Mm -hmm. I can pull that 150 out. I can go get three homes. That's going to pay me, you know, probably 15 to $1,800 a month in passive income. And then just like the banking concept, I'm going to be an honest banker. I'm going to take that cash flow. I'm going to pay back my gold loan with it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm flowing it back in every month. I'm paying myself back with interest and I just continue yep. that system. Yeah, no, I like that. And wow, a lot to, a lot to unwrap there. So the, with the gold and silver leasing, it really is just, in a way, as you still own the physical metal, you don't mm -hmm. lose ownership. You're basically just leasing it out or even renting it out, if you will, to the big players, so to speak. And then they pay mm -hmm. you, let's just, so if you said the minimum, roughly $20,000, can that be a mix of gold and silver? Is that to be 20,000 of gold or 20,000 of silver, one or the other? You could mix. Yeah, you okay, could mix. Then. Okay. The, the value, yeah, it's 25, 30. So if you did half gold, you know, 500 ounces of silver and five sure. ounces of gold. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're saying, you know, round numbers, $20,000 in precious metals. Like, you know, we talked about a lot of the gurus, so to speak. Oh, they're just shiny rocks. They don't cash flow. They, yeah, you, know, you could buy a toga thousands of years ago with a gold coin and you can buy a good suit with a gold coin now. But then with, you know, getting 3%, now you're cash flowing, math wasn't my strong suit, but about six, $700 a year then on your holdings just for sitting there basically, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you still got the long-term appreciation, mm -hmm. you know, and my team, we're, we're working on an infographic right now because on the periodic table, gold is arguably the most <laughs> useful periodic element. Yeah. And, and it does some crazy stuff. If you do some research, they're actually discovering that gold cures cancer. If you inject a cancer cell with gold, the cancer dies. Interesting. Isn't that crazy? I'm, I'm guessing a small amount of gold. We're not injecting a gold coin under the skin. Oh, no, yeah. We're doing like little <laughs> micro fraction yeah. injections in there, but it kills cancer. You know, there were the, like a couple of years ago before this whole FTX thing happened with crypto, there was this whole crypto versus gold. And I would remind yeah. people, hey, you couldn't trade crypto if it wasn't for gold. Your iPhone yeah. needs gold, right? You know, people talking about going to space, the outside coating of an astronaut's hat is coated with a very thin layer of gold to protect yeah. them. They can't go to space without gold. Yeah. So it's there, it's embedded and, and it's very valuable and useful. Mm -hmm. Well, and even like, you know, we haven't really touched base on like the silver aspect. I mean, everybody looks at it where, okay, a silver coin, a silver jewelry, whatever the case is, but silver is in medical instruments. It's used in biotech. It's used in solar panels. It's used in iPhones. It's used in, you know, Tesla. pretty much just about everything. <laughs> yeah. So, so right. I, I love gold and silver as a store of value. And I think that's really the conversation, right? Like fundamentally wealth comes down to, to really three things. And I would, I would add a fourth one, actually, you know, obviously you need to be financially educated. Yeah. So that's the first thing. And we teach our clients, I'm, I'm doing a, a challenge right now that we're doing with all of our clients. It's called the big three challenge. Okay. So I'm doing it myself. And so every day it's about doing three things. First one is every day you spend 10 minutes a day learning about money. Okay. Hey, can we have an online university for this? So we give our clients access to Wealth Dynamics University, but it can be a book. It can be your podcast. It can be a TikTok, a YouTube. It can be Investopedia, whatever. But 10 minutes a day learning something about money. 
Yeah. The second thing is you, you do something every day to earn additional income. Mm. We all want passive income, which is great, but the route there is active. Yeah. Right. You get enough active income, you save that active income, by the way, in stores of value. So that's mm -hmm. the mistake is people, they exchange their time, their value for currency. Yeah. And then they never exchange the currency for a store of value. And it's right. like, you know, the currency expires every year. It gets, yeah. it's like you, you put your milk in the fridge because it would go bad if you didn't. You take your currency and put it in the store of value because it would go bad if you didn't. Mm -hmm. And then you do that so that you can exchange that store of value for a cash cash flow producing asset, a passive mm -hmm. income producing asset. And that, that bolsters the income again. Yeah. And so I think that's the, that. yeah. And I think that's the key point, the cash flowing asset. Cause I can't tell you how many people I've talked to like, Oh, well I invest in real estate. Oh, really? Oh yeah. We got a cabin up by the lake. Okay. Do you Airbnb it? Well, no. Okay. Do you have a debt on it? Well, no, we paid it off. You know, it's owned free and clear. Okay. You still have mm -hmm. insurance taxes, maintenance, upkeep, and you're not getting any income. So explain to me how this is investing in real estate, but you know, that's another topic. <laughs> Yeah. And that's a great point of that's a, that's a store of value. You know, yep. you're, you're, nothing wrong with it. You're storing your oh, value. Exactly, I think it's yeah. a rather expensive way to do it. You know, like you mentioned utilities and insurance, there's a lot mm -hmm. of drag on that, but that is a store of value, not an investment. It doesn't produce anything. Yeah. I think uh, there's a quote uh, years and years ago. I'm sure you're familiar with them too. Uh, Robert Allen of the no money down real estate back in the nineties, early 2000, where he always had a quote, uh, uh, don't feed the alligator or don't have an alligator where you just talked about it. it's yes, you own a piece of land, you own a piece of property, a store of value, like you said, but it's eating cash flow every single month, whether it's maintenance, taxes, insurance. It's like you want it to be profitable. You want it to be spending, you know, spinning off uh, money for you. And I think that's a trap that a lot of people get into, whether it's a lake cabin or a new boat or whatever shiny object <laughs> floats their boat. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I think that that's more of, I don't know, that's an old school way of doing it, right? Like I'm going to buy a cabin so that six times a year I can go use it. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's where like as a consumer, because that's what you're doing at that time is you're consuming and there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with consuming as long as it doesn't outweigh what you produce. Right. Um, as a consumer, you know, I just did a whole week using other people's cabins. Mm hmm. You know, it cost me a couple thousand dollars in Airbnb and I could use their stuff and I didn't have to maintain it. And when I was done yeah. with it, I could leave it. And I didn't have to worry about it. And and I would rather do that and then keep my cash and put that to work in my own assets. Yep, exactly. Right? And so if you have a great Airbnb, I would rather pay you 300 bucks a night for five or six nights, call it done. And yep. you get benefit because I get the benefit of living there. You get the cash flow. And then I free up my actual capital to put that in, to, into things that pay pay for my lifestyle rather exactly. than things that consume my income. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I don't know, I kind of like, I'll make this the last point, but I think you and I could go back and forth. It's like, I think of, I can't remember who said it, but it was basically where someone's asset, one's asset is another's liability. One's liability is another one's asset. And taking a step farther, I think you can also look at really just about anything, it can be a liability or an asset. I mean, I think of cars and back to Dave Ramsey, you know, he just rallies against cars like, oh, you should just get a used car, drive it to the ground. It should be worth next to nothing because it's a drag on you, which is true. But then I remember a while back, I think it was, I'll say it was Russ and Joey of uh, Wealth Without Wall Street. They had interviewed a guy that he had an intricate system of like 12 cars that he leased out on Turo and he made a full-time business out of it. It's like, all right, now the car is an asset paying him, even though that same car might be a liability for someone else. Yeah, you know, and and even if you don't do Turo, you know, a number of years back I did this and I don't have this car anymore, but, you know, through my business, I got a BMW X6, mm -hmm. right? I did that through my life insurance policy. So I take my policy loan, my principal yep. value is still growing. I then buy the car with the policy loan. I get a tax deduction for my company. I get to write mm -hmm. off the entire purchase, which is like 60, 65,000. Yep. And then I make a car payment back to myself, principal and interest. And when I count up at the end of five years by doing it that way, how much money I have accumulated in a mast mm -hmm. versus if I pay cash or versus if I borrow money from the bank, my, my rate of growth on capital and like my warehouse of wealth that I've built up, it was like 12, 15% per year yep. over five years that I'm making on just self-financing my own car and taking that tax deduction. Yeah. And fast forward 10 years, you have a, you still have that car. Well, obviously you said you don't, but you might still have that car and you still have a income producing asset and you still have your infinite banking policy. So. 
yeah but, yeah cool. that's the way to go about it and i think i think like you know maybe a good ending point on this john is like when people hear this stuff it's like there's a lot out there and, and that's one of the things my company does is we help people line up the dominoes mm-hmm. right otherwise it's like you know a bowl of oatmeal like it's it, all the ingredients <laughs> sound good but if i put them all in at the same time it's not going to be good oatmeal there's certain ones you would use and so we help people do like the sequence but i think the starting point is if you change just one thing yep. with your finances, which is the location you store your value, mm-hmm. if you can just start there, right? And you put it into something like the life insurance or the gold and silver or the real estate where mm-hmm. you're no longer funding someone else. Because when you put it in banks, they're getting the money, they're getting the benefit. When you put it yep. with Wall Street, they're getting the money, they're getting the benefit. You put it in the 401k, the IRS makes a killing when you finally pull that money out. Exactly, so, yeah. Just change one thing. We're not saying change everything today. Just change one thing. And if uh-huh. you just change where you put your money, that opens up the door to the rest of the stuff we're talking about. Yeah. And like you said, change one thing and kind of like baby steps with Dave Ramsey, you know, no one snaps their fingers and they're wealthy overnight, but one step at a time is going to get you there. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, maybe it's a good ending point, Jerry. And again, I want to thank you for taking the time coming on my show. And I, like I said, I think you and I could go back and forth for hours. So if I had to get you back on a later episode, but if for anyone sure. out there is interested in, you know, learning more about what you do, interested in wealth dynamics, or even, you know, maybe has gold and silver just sitting around, it's like, gosh, I'd really like to get this cash flowing, have another income stream. What's the best way to reach out to you and find out more about you and your business? Yeah. So actually I want to give away, it's called a wealth potential analysis. I want to give this to your listeners. So if you guys go to analysis.wealthdynamics.com, now dynamics is spelled a little differently. It's (laughs) D-Y-N-A-M-X. And and so if you go to analysis.wealthdynamics.com, we spent the last several months developing a wealth potential analysis. And so you'll fill out a hundred questions and it'll measure, it'll measure your personal finances against the top 100 wealth building factors. Okay. And so at the end of this, you'll actually get a graph that shows where you are in each category. How are you doing compared to where you should be? Um, And so you can start there and then you can do a free consultation with my team. We'll jump on a call, go over your graph with you and give you a strategy so I want to offer that as a freebie to all your listeners today. Perfect. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And uh, again, for all those listening, driving, walking the dog, whatever you're doing, I'll have this in a clickable format in the show notes as, as well as all the other resources that were mentioned. So Jerry, with that, thanks again for uh, coming on the show and uh, best of luck for you the rest of the summer here. Awesome. Thanks, John. You too. Thank you for listening. Be sure to share, rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For more updates, check out www.wealthandfreedomnexus.com. Remember, nothing on this show should be considered tax, legal, investment, or professional advice. This show is produced solely for educational and informational purposes. Please consult an appropriate and licensed tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for specific advice for your situation. For distribution or publication rights or media interviews, please contact the host.